Well, hey, everybody, this is Devin Berryhill, and you're on the podcast, Creatives Who Thrive. I'm your host, and really excited today about this program, like I am about all of our guests that are on here. But basically, our show is here to tell stories from artists who make money to make more art. And uh, you're probably an artist who's watching. You've, you're a creative of some form, maybe a musician or an author, a painter, film director in the making, whatever it may be. And you may also be at a different multiple stages in life, whether it be a, you're just coming into uh, learning to be a creative or maybe you're a very experienced creative person and uh, you're learning some new tips for today's. So that's really what this program's about. I feel like I'm just kind of that guy bringing everybody on the journey together. So today our guest is someone who is in multiple mediums, whether it be music, that's where I know uh, our guest, but also filmmaker, uh, TV editor, uh, photographer, author, educator. So, so much to talk about today, but I'm excited for our guest. Please welcome Mark Sanders, aka Mark Malibu. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Everyone knows me as Mark Sanders, and then they have to go, what is it? Oh, yeah, it's Mark Wasego or Mark Malibu or whatever. But yeah, it's <laughs> Mark Malibu is a name I came up with when I was 15, and it still sticks. <laughs> but you're from Toronto. How's that happen? <laughs> uh, it's funny, you know. Um, I'm an English kid born in Sweden. My dad traveled all over, but when I was in Toronto, I started a surf band in 1979, 80 probably the only guys doing it in Canada back then. And I just had to come up with a name. So when you're 15, you go, I'm a surf guy. So I guess I'm Mark Malibu. And then the Wasegas is like the biggest freshwater beach in Canada. So that's where that comes from. Okay. Crazy. Right. <laughs> yeah, you're riding the 30 footers there in Toronto. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> six footers. <laughs> six footer. oh, that's, good. that's not bad, actually. I'm six foot. So. There you go. Well, well, Mark, you know, in this show, we, we really like to have people up front share their story. How how did you be first discover, oh, I'm creative, I love to do this, and I want to do this for my life? Tell us the story. You know, it, it's funny. I always think, like, where did the flip the switch for music? And I remember when we first moved to Canada, my dad worked for General Electric. And when you worked at General Electric, you got a discount on their products. And he brought home a record player. And I got to tell you, my dad does not have, like, you have a musical dad. My dad had a couple <laughs> records. It was like <laughs> Christmas in Sweden, um, the Irish singers at some tavern. And I think the coolest thing he had was Nat King Cole. So we were in a hardware, it, we were in a hardware store. And back then records were everywhere. And my older sister was jumping up and down. We got to buy some records. So my parents bought is the Beatles Twist and Shout album, which is only released in Canada. It's part of their first album in B-Sides and more of the monkeys. And something about those two albums flipped a switch. And I knew the lyrics and I could sing all the songs before I hit kindergarten. Mm. Oh, I was always into music. So um, we moved to New York and I kind of grew up in the school system there and they had a great music program. So I was mm. taking recorder, I was in the choir, I, I did several years of violin. I became the drummer in their school orchestra. Yeah. And I just, music was everything, you know? And when we moved back to Canada, um, they said, well, until we see where your grades are, you can't join the school band. And when I heard them, they were kind of crappy. So I thought, well, I don't want to join that band anyway. So I was in a drum corps, but all my friends started taking guitar lessons at the age of 12. Mm. 
So my parents didn't want me to have a drum kit, too noisy. So they signed me up for guitar lessons. And my dad came home with this guitar from work that he had bought for five bucks. And it was one of those typical kind of guitars where you needed vice grips to bring the strings down, <laughs> you know, to the neck of the guitar. But I practiced and I practiced and I had months, uh, lessons for about three months. And then they raised the price from like 215 to 275. And my parents couldn't afford that. So I got my dad's old reel to reel and I started slowing down records and teaching myself on the guitar. Hmm. And within a year of doing that, I'd saved up all my paper route and allowance money and I bought my first electric guitar. And so at 12, I was already playing in a band. Wow. So that was kind of my life was playing in a band. And very early on, I decided I wanted to do original music. So, you know, the songs you write when you're a kid aren't that great. Right, right. But um, some of the songs on the Wasega CDs are ones I wrote when I was 15 and 16. I, I, we went in the studio back then did six original songs, which I had written. And since then we've recorded two, two more of them. And I'm thinking, wow, I wrote that when I was 15. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of where that started. The music right. side. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You, you talked about uh, being in a, a great school band program. Um, I had a similar experience um, where I was introduced to all the instruments, not just the, the guitar. I had that in my family, of course, but um, you know, I got to play, I played low brass because I was big. I was the only guy they thought could carry the tuba in the uh, <laughs> junior high marching band. <laughs> so I played tuba, um, but I had a great band director. Did you have like a mentor or band director maybe back then that that really kind of someone you was like, okay, he, he showed you, he gave you the keys to the kingdom of music. Well, it, you know, when I first started playing violin, my parents aren't musical at all. They don't like those records they had back then. They don't play anything. They don't do anything. They don't listen to music. But <laughs> they told my parents at parent teacher night what a gifted musician I was. Mm -hmm. and, and my dad, in his typical dad fashion, he says, well, his violin playing sounds like he's torturing cats. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then when I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And when you get a drum, it was a drum pad. And then maybe go down the end of the house to practice my drums. But they saw me play with the school. And I'd only been in the school band a couple of months and I became the main drummer. Mm. And, and the drum teacher was so impressed. He would he would test me and say, see if you can play this. And he would put a complicated piece of music in front of me and I would just play it. And you, you can just see his expression. This guy's, you know, he can play. Yeah. So, yeah, so. it was so great that a, a, high, a high public school, public school program would allow you to leave school every day, your class and take these lessons. And they provided you with the violins. Uh, we had to buy the drum pads, which was a big deal, but the, it was instruction every single week and you would have lessons and I would, yeah. and I would religiously practice those things. Yeah. And, but it's hard because, you know, I'm putting on my Elton John and David Bowie records and I'm playing along on the little rubber drum pad. And it doesn't quite <laughs> give you the effect of when you finally get an electric guitar. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So you got the electric guitar the kids in your neighborhood, New Year's school or whatever, your area there in Canada are all playing guitar. So you, you said you were in your, your band by 12. So give us kind of 12 year old Mark to the Wasagas and starting to get into the, the punk scene. Well, so the first band I'm in, it was traditionally rock and roll music and they liked, you know, Led Zeppelin and heavier stuff. In fact, the drummer's uncle was the drummer in Rush. So oh, yeah. yeah, not not Neil Peart, right. the first guy, John Rice. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I remember I was playing a party for them, and they must have just thought this was awful. Twelve-year-old kids <laughs> doing an instrumental of "Stairway to Heaven" poorly and whatnot. <laughs> but very, when I was fifteen, I really wanted to start a punk band, and in 1977, there's like not a lot of kids who want to play that music. They haven't heard it, but I wow. heard it in England. Sure. So. Um, I finally got a band together. I started recruiting people and teaching them how to play. That was my only way I put a band together. So Steve, who I, who I showed the first little few drum beats to, he went around the neighborhood finding drums that were in people's garages. And he is a very mechanical guy. He built his kit out of these refuse, you know, <laughs> and we started playing and we play and 
this is where I let, learned to kind of do it for myself is, you know, when you're that age, there's no place to play. So I would just hear there's, oh, there's a party. There's a party. We'll come and play the party. So we just played parties all over Scarborough. And um, there was a bad party at ha- and some bad things happened at the party and half of our gear was stolen. But that was the turning point when I said to Steve, I think we're going to be a surf band. Huh. Wow. Yeah. You know, so um, the, the gear wasn't expensive. It was amps out of the garbage and everything. So he had saved a bunch of money and went and bought his first drum kit. And I got a better amp out of insurance. And we just spent the summer, the two of us, playing surf songs, you know, wow. learning the standards like wipe out and walk, don't run and whatnot. Yeah. What were you listening? Did you find some old so, Safari's records, Dick Dale, Ventures kind of stuff? Well, I was still really into 60s music. And as a kid, I'd be the only kid at these record shows. Like most of them were like, I mean, they seem like old guys, but they're probably guys my age now. But they were all into jazz. So like jazz was very collectible in the 70s and, and the 80s. And it, I was always looking for cool 60s bands. And because I didn't, I didn't know anything outside the Beatles, the typical stuff, Beatles and Stones, I bought a lot of records based on the front covers. Mm-hmm. So I was at a record show once and they just tore down the hotel, unfortunately, down the road from me where it was at. But there was a stack of Ventures albums there, like eight or 10 albums. And they were all brand new, two bucks. And I bought them because the front couple of the front pit, uh, covers had really hot chicks on. Let's <laughs> go say. Yeah. yeah. So, so I brought it home and I, it was kind of scary at first because I was playing the first album and I guess it must have been Sweet Sleepwalk. My dad goes by, he goes, I know that song. And I was going, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but I really did Walk, Don't Run and I learned to play that. And, sure. and then I started putting together a set list. And then once again, I had to go out and recruit people to play in the band. You know, so by 1980, we started playing downtown. Uh, first time we played downtown was just a few songs, but the problem is we were still underage. I can remember playing somewhere and the club owner, when they realized we were so underage, she was so mad. She smacked me in the head. She kicked my amp down the stairs. She goes, you'll get us shut down. You know, <laughs> so I, it was a bit of a reset. What do I do? But around the same time, I met a group of people that were starting um, a punk rock mod reggae ska youth dance every Friday night. So I wanted to be a part of that group because I felt it was kind of my way into the scene downtown. So the people organizing, it was about six of us from the age of 14 to 18. And every Friday we would rent a hall and people would come. There was no drinking, no nothing like that because we couldn't get a liquor license and we were supposed to be for underage kids. And there would be DJs. And then by about four months in, Vera, who was her concept, she said, I think we're going to have bands. I said, Vera, I got a band. We're going to, I really want to play. That became the beginning of like a five-year run of these shows. Um, It would basically be DJs most nights and bands once a month or every other month. And we played a bunch of those. And that built our reputation in Toronto at 17, at a time when uh, most people were playing bars. So we... We're part of that. It got us into um, fanzines that were part of the scene. It got us on independent releases of cassettes that were sold internationally. And it was a big step for, you know, I'm still going to high school. And it, that didn't really happen to high school kids in the 70s or the 80s. Right. It, was, it was industry stuff, you know? Right. So that was a big step for music for me, was doing that. Yeah. So kind of like the Beatles in Hamburg, you, you guys were able to kind of hone your craft, so to speak, and develop your sound because you had a place to play all the time. We had a uh, place to play. Yeah. Somewhat regularly. And it well, was a five-year uh, period. Too, it was so. a place to play. And it was also, it legitimized us as a downtown club act. Yeah. You know, that yeah. playing basements, I mean, is cool, but Everyone, everyone had a band back then was playing in the basement or playing in a party. We were downtown playing, you know, right. and, and people, it was good and it was bad. I mean, there was people in my high school that weren't allowed to hang out with me because I was playing downtown in a band and the way I looked and everything oh, wow. it was like yeah. off limits, like avoid right. the kid, he's bad news. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you had learned how to communicate too. That's the other thing. One of the things in this show that um, I really want to bring out is um, how important marketing your craft is. You were starting to learn how to market. You were learning the basics. Okay, well, what... The, the name of the game in the late 70s, early 80s was the fanzines. And like you said, you were you were getting your music on a, maybe a compilation, what we call a compilation album, you know, sure. back then cassette tapes, but or mixtapes or whatever. Um, but you were able to to make that happen. So when did you was there a point where you were starting to see some monetary benefits from the band? Not in that band. Basically, when that band that band disbanded when I finished high school. To me, that was my high school band. Everything was cool and fun. But at that point, you know, when you leave high school, you're trying to think of the future. You know, what am I going to do for a living? You know, right. and I, I didn't know it yet, but it, a career was going to present itself to me. But it was going to take a couple more years of kind of experimenting with music. Steve and I became part of a, uh, like a new wave band after that. I played keyboards in the band, synthesizers, mm -hmm. and Steve was mm -hmm. a drummer. And the other guys in the band were much older than us, like back then, much older is like six and 10 years older, but they had been in bar bands before. So that's when I learned, you know, about getting to know people who run bars, promoters, dealing with promoters, presenting yourselves properly with pictures, making sure your artwork had some consistency, mm -hmm. um, hooking up with real producers and real management, mm -hmm. you know, so that two year period for me, um, I started to think, is there a career in music? Right. And um, we, we attracted, we, we had a huge crowd in the city, you know? Um, we, were, we were more like U2 and Simple Minds, whereas everyone else in the Toronto scene was more like Bauhaus and Joy Division. So we didn't get a lot of respect because we were kind of more commercial. But suddenly we had a manager that was one of the top managers in Canada. Um, we had one of the top producers in Canada. We had uh, recorded an album and it was about to be released on a major label. And this is one of my mistakes is I'm a very, at that point I wasn't very patient and I was growing angry with some of the band members and I left. Mm. I said, that's it. And being one of the, one of the songwriters, the main songwriters, no one was going to take a chance on a band that had lost one of the main songwriters. Right. So I probably, in retrospect, smart Mark would have let the album come out and then see you guys, you know? Yeah. But that didn't happen. So. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that too, because, you know, that's one of the things I want out of this podcast is, you know, there's, there's kind of mountains and valleys, there's mistakes too. I mean, we could sit here and present all this, you know, rosy, Oh, you know, it just happened to be that, you know, we got a manager and it just happened to be that we got signed by this major label and now we're on, you know, this and that, but I mean, it's good to tell the stories, the mistake, you know, um, some of the things that like, you know, for you, it was kind of leaving a little early from a, a project that maybe, you know, Oftentimes, you know, bands break up. I've been in, you know, numerous, you know, 30 or 40 bands myself. And it seems, you know, you look back and a lot of times it's petty arguments or smaller things that probably, you know, they, you know, it's this, the old saying, you know, don't cry over spilt milk kind of stuff, you know. And um, we look back and go, oh, I should have done that. And, you know, and we could sit and look and regret. It's not regret. It's more like, okay, listen it's not the end of my creative life. I'm going to take that experience and apply it. And I, I know that's what you did. So the next step for you uh, was that, so you weren't in the Wasagas yet. The Wasaga story comes up here. Or, or, no, the Wasagas or, are done. The Wasagas are done. And that's when I'm still young, oh, okay. I'm 20 years old. Oh, wow. Okay. You know? So this, this band had been going on and I left and I immediately had like a ton of offers to join other bands with recording contracts and whatnot. Oh, okay. A ton. And, and I, in retrospect, I think it was just the way I looked because I had long blonde hair and, and <laughs> had crazy clothes and everything. But um, while I was in that band, I had started and, and just backtracking a bit. When I was in high school, uh, my father insisted I took every math and science course that was available. So that was it. I was a year ahead in math. I'd done relations and functions and calculus and 
physics and chemistry and biology. So that was kind of my field. I was, I was more, he was kind of pushing me more in the mathematical side because he's an engineer and a physicist. Yeah. And um, the great thing about helping him when he got his personal company started was he got the first Apple computer. Mm. So I became really interested in computers. And I was, help, I was learning, like he was showing me what his computer did. And then I remember in 1985, my sister bringing home the first Apple, like the Apple Mac. Mm -hmm. And she says, I've been giving this computer to analyze. And I'd never seen a mouse before. So, of course, you're holding it like a softball. And, and But <laughs> there was something special about that computer. It was only two pieces of software. There was Mac Write and Mac Paint. So suddenly you could do pictures yeah. on the computer. Yeah, yeah. So she left it at the house. She didn't want it. So I got to know it. So me being into synthesizers and music and having a knowledge of computers got me a job at the main music store in Toronto as their computer music specialist. Wow. Okay. So I was doing that at the same time as that other band was kind of having success. But when I was at the music store, I was a sponge for any knowledge. Recording. I want to know recording. I want to know mixing consoles. I want to know different types of tape. I want to know delays. I want to know reverbs. And I also was at the forefront of computer software for music, which before, I mean, the software does everything now, but back then, the first piece of software that came in the store was through an RCA cable into the drumulator, and you could just program your drum machine on an Apple II right. computer. Yeah, yeah. Then there was MIDI, and, and before um, Pro Tools, there was a thing called Sound Designer, which you could draw waveforms that would go into the emulator too. Hmm. So, you know, I was kind of there and you started to meet a lot of people in the industry. Like I gave Getty Lee a lesson one day on the emulator. Um, I had Eric Clapton on the phone when he was dealing with Kurzweil. So you start helping people. Depeche Mode brought their stuff in and I serviced it, you know, and <laughs> so you start. It was that was a mistake because suddenly I was on every road manager's list. If you have, you know, synth problems in Toronto, phone this guy. So. You know, like the Pesh Mode with all those call. This is broken. You know, uh, the guys from Genesis, the guys, you know, Pink Floyd, all these people were calling. And it's just like, oh, my God, I'm not even a service guy. I just remember everything everyone tells me. If this breaks on this, it's that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, that but, was some good networking opportunities, though. Well, my very early on in the store, I noticed the people that could afford to buy all the fancy gear were the film composers. Hmm. So that's when I got the idea for a career. I said, I'm going to take all this knowledge I have and my limited skills on the keyboards and transition into composing for television. Okay. Because that was a real paying job. Wow. And I was at the store for two years and I befriended all the composers in town. And I, was, I kept on telling them, I said, if you ever need someone to work with you, apprentice with you, I'm available. Right. So I got an offer first from a commercial house. But I remember they offered me like a hundred bucks a week. And I, I live very frugally, but like to me, 250 a week was like my bottom line to get by and pay my bills. So I, I couldn't take that. Then someone else came to me who had got a job on a TV series and he could pay me that. So I went on to work with him and he did some kid shows and some courtroom dramas and whatnot. And he saw my skills and he said, you know what? You have more of a brain for sound editing. Hmm. Wow. So he recommended me for a police TV show called Diamonds. And this was about 1987 now. And I hadn't worked in editing of sound or anything like that. Went to the interview. They said, fine, you've got the job. And I thought, great. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> so... They said, well, you know, everything's on these mixing cue sheets. Um, and then you have to keep the track of, of which scenes are on what tracks and whatnot. It was all being edited onto a 24 track at that point in time. So I said, can I have an old set of cue sheets? I went home that weekend and I read those cue sheets top to bottom, getting an understanding of, well, the in time code here and the up time code is here. And this is all this takes. So this goes on this track. So I basically taught myself through the weekend what I was supposed to be doing. Hmm. Started Monday. And I remember we just hit the ground running. And after about a month, I said, I just want to tell you guys, I've never done this before. You know, I just, I just, 
and, Don't and disclose. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of where I got my start. And I was doing one hour television, which is kind of what everybody wants to do, you yeah. know? And then within a couple of years, I was the main sound editor and I had my own crew and I was sourcing films, you know? Nice. It's, it's all DIY and chasing. You got to chase the job, right? Yeah. 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 No, that's great. That's great. And, you know, again, going back to being in that music store, you know, again, you were kind of, uh, that was a place of, of community where people came in, you were able to see it. You saw who's, who's got the money really here. It's these film guys. (laughs) Exactly. It's not musicians. Yeah. You were able to kind of figure that out just by, you know, someone coming to the cash register and you're like, Oh, what do you do? Oh, well, I do this. Then you're like, okay, wait a sec. I might, I, I might need to look at some other options here. Well, so it, was, you went, it was about carving out a, a, a career and seeing where a real career would be. You know, and, um, I always say I entered the film business because people say, oh, you're in film. I'm in the film business. The business part is really important to understand because when I agree to do something for somebody, um, regardless of what pay level it's at, I've made a contract to do the job to the best of my ability and get it done on time. You know, and I think people forget that. But to me, it was always going to be a business. And then it's not always about making money. I still will do jobs for people uh, pro bono if I feel that they deserve it. Yeah. No, and I don't have to. I don't have to, but I will. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 So you moved on. Okay. So your film credits are just amazing. I mean, you went from the sound editor. I'm reading here in your bio that. You were uh, an animation, Beetlejuice, The Adventures of Tin Tin. You're on live action, Counter-Strike. Um, then you got into the picture editor business as well. Um, so, yeah. So on the sound. So I really loved sound editing. It was great. But those were, like, it's hard for people in California to think about this because you've had a business for so many decades, but it was just kind of getting percolating in Toronto back then. So there wasn't, um, the editing wasn't part of any type of a union or guild. Yeah. So you had to depend on people's honesty to get paid. And yeah. when you were a sound editor, you were at the end of the line. Yeah. So my only reason to move to picture editing was, and I call it moving up the food chain, is because you start editing when they start filming. And when they're filming, money runs freely. Yeah. And then when they stop filming, they do a cost analysis. They go, oh, my gosh, we're over budget. And suddenly they are squeezing the sound editors. Right. So it's, it was not chain. like I had this great artistic drive to become a film editor. I wanted to get paid. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it, it's yeah. it crass as that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Once again, it's the business part of film business. So you got into the film. So what were you what were some of your first projects there? Um, I felt I once again, as you tend to uh, get absorbed into people, you know, I fell into a group of people who are making um, action movies and teen comedies for basically the direct to VHS market at the time. Uh, Blockbuster had just opened up and they had a thirst for product. A lot of the major labels hadn't quite committed to releasing their films on VHS. So there was a company in Canada I worked for uh, more and more, almost full time at one point. Um, and they, they specially did all the snake eater movies. Um, it was just, you know, find a, a martial artist or somebody who can kind of say their lines and we're going to do a, a cop movie, you know? <laughs> so, you know, you're not going to win an award for films like that, but they were plentiful because Blockbuster had such a vor- voracious appetite for picking up films. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up working for a guy, John Dunning, who was like Canada's Roger Corman. So this is when my career really took off because they really depended on tax credits um, to make their movies. So they'd say, we're sending you to Vancouver for two movies. Okay. Now you're in Montreal. Are you going to go to New York? Okay. Now you're going to Luxembourg. So uh, (laughs) fortunately I had a place I could lock up and just keep it totally locked up. And, and, um, I spent a lot of years living in hotels with my editing equipment. Now you tell people I travel a lot with film. It sounds exciting, but I basically knew my cleaning lady and I knew the the ladies who served me breakfast and lunch and, you know, 
yeah, yeah. but it was it allowed me to build up my credentials so um i could eventually come back to toronto and, and then forge a, a bit of a career in television editing which is um pays better uh the runs are longer and you can actually have a family Yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's one of those things as you get older and wanted to get married or you find the right woman and want to have a family that really starts, you know, you, a lot of the folks that I've interviewed so far and, and people that I know it's, that's the one thing for me, it was kind of a similar story where I was kind of at the Zenith of my touring and then having my first child and uh, you know, you kind of, you want to be there. Right. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, I'd leave for a, a tour and I'd come back and she didn't look the same. She'd grown up, she, you know, I, I, I missed that. And so I think that kind of drew a lot of creatives to get a little more serious on the business side and learning how to monetize and, and be, and, and, and it's a natural thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's part of life. I mean, some people choose otherwise and they put their values, uh, in their work and try to have the family and try to make that work. And for some, it doesn't work. You know, I've had a, a number of friends who are kind of casualties in that, that, that side of the world, but uh, it's good to hear that you've been able to make that balance. And that's, that's part of what this show is about too, is how to keep your priorities straight um, and still monetize. And there are ways to do that. It just, you know, you're not able to sometimes take those opportunities that put you in a hotel for two months in Vancouver when you live in Toronto um, you miss out on some of that, but again, what's your, what's your, what's your priorities? You know, if, if your priority is just to be on the road, you know, all the time, it's probably not good to, you know, get married and start a family at that point. You need to make those decisions before you go into it. And that's, that's an important thing on this show for, especially for our younger viewers, if you're watching, you know, is to keep, keep the main thing, the main thing. If, if, if you, if you want to have uh a dynamic career, you know, you need to uh, keep things in order. Um, but you were able to learn a lot of the craft when you weren't tied down with family and that kind of thing. And, and most of us who are uh, creatives who've gone on to be more um, economically successful have been able to hone their craft when they were younger, when they had a lot more time. So that's good. Um, so move on. I mean, I'm looking at your resume again, you, you, you work for Hallmark channel, did a lot of stuff there. Um, uh, as well. And we've kind of talked through some of that, but I, I did want to get into, you went back to school. That's interesting to me. You went to um, George Brown college and studied film and TV because you felt, uh, well, tell us why you did that. Well, I, I, it's funny. You get these things that nag at you. And for me, a lot of people in the industry had been to film school and my parents wouldn't pay for film school. I mean, at one point I looked into a school in town that taught you recording technology and, it, and, you know, university was $1,500 a year at that point in time in a Canadian university. This one was 4,500. That money wasn't there. My just, my dad had just started his own company. So, and they wouldn't spend it on something which was an artistic endeavor. So I knew I had to be self-taught. So after getting going in the film business and then becoming a picture editor, I thought, what can make me a better picture editor? And I'd read a few books on, you know, it's all the typical ones, film art and whatnot, all about sequences of shots. But I thought, what am I really doing here? I'm storytelling. So I went back to, I signed up at George Brown for a writing course. And at first it was just story structure. Did that, got a good grade. Signed up the next uh, semester for write act one for your screenplay. Did that did really well, did act two, did act three, took dialogue. And I, and I was a couple credits away from getting the degree, but I was so busy with work. I just thought, is this degree going to help me? So I decided not to funny story. So but what I had done while I was doing the writing thing and still doing picture editing, because my, my apartment had turned into a post-production facility. Um, 
Uh, I had a writer's workshop at my place for five years. Every week on a Tuesday, people would come in with their screenplays that they were working on and they would workshop, say, act one. And there would be 10. I kind of handpicked the people like so it would be people who could give positive, creative, uh, you know, um, critiques. Didn't want anyone who was super negative or whatever. So I had a really good group of people and people would kind of come in and come out. Um, but that went for five years. And some of those people actually went on to be working in television and film now as writers. It, be, it, it was great. And and people would say, how much does it cost? I said, it costs nothing. I, I think it's just good to get together and talk about ideas and structure. And, and, and um, so that was great. That actually landed me a job with the Female Eye Film Festival. I became their director of the script development program at, at the, it was like the first female, uh, film, female film festival that featured only female directors. Hmm. Wow. Um, they still get noted as one of the top 20 film festivals to submit your, your films to. And I'm still friendly with that, but I did that for eight years and we would workshop shop scripts in front of crowds and critique them. Um, we started an industry event where writers could meet um, television people and producers and agents and whatnot. So it was, that was all about networking and whatnot. whatnot. And I think it taught people networking is really important. Sure. And it, yeah. and it was something I understood for sure. That, that's so important. I, I, I want to park on that for a second is, is being a part of a community. Um, that uh, just the fact that, uh, I mean, we're, we're, the show is called creatives who thrive, right? Well, Right there, you got together people in round table kind of discussions about each other's work and you were, you, you had to be vulnerable, right? I mean, you, you brought your film and everybody watched it or whatever creative endeavor they were a part of. And it's like, here, here's my work. You know, they weren't, they weren't kind of uh, lone rangers, you know, they, 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 they submitted their work to a, a small group of people. I mean, it wasn't just everybody could, I mean, each person who was there had a certain acumen of creativity and it was like we're all on the same we all got as much to gain and lose right that you know it's not like it was just the public going oh that's terrible I like that and having no reason you know I mean there was like intelligent discussion tell me about that process well each evening I and mean, it was kind of a I'm all about structure so each evening started with when I had a massive DVD li library on writing screenplays, which I had bought online, like it, there was about 80 DB. So we start by watching the DVD and the content might be how to write a bit of character. And then we take a bit of a break and then someone would say, okay, I've written this romantic comedy and I just want to workshop the first 25 pages. So everyone in the room would get a character to read and the writer wasn't allowed to read. She had to listen or he or she had to listen to it. Wow. And, oh, cool. and I would normally do um, the narration because that was the most, that was the worst part for anyone to read because those are the most words. Sure. And you would get a sense when things are working or not. Um, like you would get a sense of the character and, and um, do these people really sound like they're not going to get together so they can get together, you know? So it was really, a, um, does anything drag? You know, you like, what was this scene about? I don't understand. And 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 because people on first drafts or even second drafts, you're putting so much of yourself into it, you don't realize that's not part of the story. Right. You know, because you say, okay, the beginning of the story, there has to be something which jump starts the story. You know, so that's gotta be in the first few pages. And and then what are their obstacles? And then what happens at the end of page 25, which sends them, you know, into a new direction with so because if there's not twists and turns it, there's what what's going on and they're just kind of standing in place wow. so it was that kind of structure we would talk about and and, and th those people would go away and rewrite it and come back and you would see the improvement yeah and then you go wow we were all part of helping this person write a better script you know and, and everyone saw the value in that yeah yeah you know it, that that Incredible because um, as a you bring your script and you're not able you you have to sit and listen to everybody do it and when you, when it's played back to you like that live and everybody's reading their part um, you know you can hear it it's like yeah. it's like 
you're 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 able to kind of get a different view and sit back from it, maybe thirty thousand foot view, so to speak, and 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 get more of an objective feel to it and see and then maybe see how the other people if, it, if there's a funny part and everybody laughs you know when it's said it's like oh well, that worked right <laughs> <laughs> or if it's serious and everybody's laughing it's like no that didn't work or you know it's like th there's that well, natural human kind of interplay that's happening that it's it's like your 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 uh your test your test tube you know your petri dish of of the experiment I used to write comedies. That was kind of my favorite thing. And I remember you, you'd you be sitting there listening to them read it back and be a check mark if they laughed and an X if they didn't. And, <laughs> and, and it'd be one of those things like, if they didn't laugh, it was gone. I either have to change the joke or take it out completely. And only because I'd read, it, I'd read a book on writing comedy and you talked about working with people like Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks who are, you know, so important in the comedy writing world. Sure. And uh, you have to be ruthless like that. But then that trans transitions as well to picture editing. You know, you're picture editing, you're, you're going, you're trying to get something happen and you go, you go, that's just not working, it's gotta go. You have to be that ruthless in editing. Um, you have, but it, what it's doing is it's continually exercising your creative muscles. So then whatever creative situation you get into, you hit, less roadblocks because you can modify your approach each time you find a problem, whether it be music, whether it be film, whether it be photography. You know, I, I did some photography and you'd run into some terrible, I, I was always outside. My photography was dog photography outside. You know, I wasn't doing things in costumes or anything. It was dogs, totally naked. It's the only naked photography I've ever done. And <laughs> dogs, no collars, out in the woods and, and and taking pictures and you, there was tons of problems. They don't want to be photographed. They want to be smelling good smells and running and swimming and whatnot. And sometimes what you think would be your biggest problem turns out to be your best shot, you know? So you have to be yeah. ready, you know, ready to take, prepared for anything. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, same thing back to the music part of it too. It's, you know, when you're playing the song, especially during the five years of, of, of playing at, in the teen club, scene that you had there um that you were able to get immediate response you play a song and it's you're thinking it's a great dance tune for instance and no one gets up and dances you're like something's wrong here <laughs> well no back, here, bro. Back, back then i learned pretty quickly that you know that our crowds weren't there for instrumental music and we were an instrumental band so i figured that i could get away with about three or four original songs before i have to play wipeout you know, <laughs> songs that they knew. And then I'd buy myself a few more original songs so I could play Walk on Run, you right, know, right. and then maybe we'd have to sing something and get, get off the stage before they throw something at us, you know? Oh, man, that's so, <laughs> that's still true. That's so true. I mean, even with the Termaliners, we're playing here in town and, you know, especially we've been a band almost three years coming up in June, but, it, you know, those first few shows, we were just like, okay we got to keep the dance floor going because it was a dance club, you know, and if you don't have the dance floor going, it's like, you're not going to keep your job. And so every fourth song, I think we played tequila. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you hit that. Da, 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 da. I mean, you know, everybody's out, you know, kind of your smart bomb, right? <laughs> yep. All else fails, hit wipe out. You, know? <laughs> you got your go-to songs, but you know, what was fun though is, is, and I'm sure you found too, is, is, every once in a while you'd pull out an original and they'd stay on the dance floor and you'd be like, well, yeah, okay, yeah, that one's, that's a good one. That one, or people, you know, were into listening and, and that kind of thing. So good job. So, um, so now you've, you've got back into music. Uh, the, and I, I apologize for saying it wrong. It's the Wasegas and here's your pick, by the oh, way. There you go. Yeah. Thank you for sending me that guitar pick. I actually yeah. tra tracked on that. I told you the other day. Yeah. You got back into music with the Wasegas. And um, in fact, we connected, this is how we connected this That's little right. album here. Um, this is Surfing Kitty Christmas, right? Xmas yeah. here. And uh, so, Tell me about getting back into music. You're kind of like me. It's like you've been, you were in music a long time ago, a lot more, and then kind of got out of it. And then you're coming back into it. Uh, tell us about that process. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, I, I'm married now. This is my second wife. And she didn't know I played guitar. 
<laughs> there was there was some dusty old guitar cases under the bed, but she didn't know because she never saw me play. And we would go and see our friends' bands play, and and we we obviously still still enjoy music. And um, 2012 was a big change for me. I had started a film company. I decided to leave it all behind because I wasn't liking their direction. And uh, I decided that's when I would return to editing. So, and and she was concerned that are you okay with that not being a producer anymore? And I said, well, I'll do a little bits and pieces, but I'm I'm happy with our life and I'm just going to edit at home. And uh, someone had presented me with a chance to play in a rockabilly band to which my response was no way. I don't play guitar anymore. I'm more than happy to sell your merch, move your amplifiers. Don't want to play. So they got together and sure enough, I moved their amps. I helped sell their merch and they were having guitar player problems and they were a really good band. And they went through and every time they'd asked me to play, I'd recommend someone else. You know, and then I thought, you know, um, maybe this was meant to be. And I hadn't played guitar in decades. So I pulled a, a guitar out I had and I couldn't even play bar chords. I couldn't strum anymore. So I focused every single night for three hours just so I could strum along with their songs. And then I started to try and learn the songs. And then within three months, I said, OK, I think I can do that. And they said, well, that's good because we're booked at this big rockabilly festival in Montreal. I thought, what have they done to me? What have they, three <laughs> months? Yeah. So I okay. played until my fingers bled. And that band, the Millwinders, was pretty good. And, and uh, the singer and bass player in it was Sarah from the Surfer Jets. Um, oh, OK. And she has a beautiful voice. I wish she would use it again. She sounds like Patsy Cline. She's phenomenal. Oh. Um, so that band did, uh, we did an album. And then it totally, it was, it was a cursed band. I should have known, but that got me playing again. So that's why the, the Wasegas reunited in 2014. Wow. And then we did the one reunion show and it was, it went over so well. It was all the original guys. Okay. Uh, which rarely happens. Right. Right. We got asked on an East coast tour. So we just <laughs> off to the East coast and then back and, and, but two of the guys in the band, they had, um, a lot of com personal commitments One guy works heavily with his church and he travels a lot. Uh, another guy is a hockey referee and he's busy a lot. So Steve and I, right from being 15 years old, we're the, we're the survivors and, and we found some new people and we've continued. So uh, nice. this, this would have been our 40th anniversary, but wow. uh, not playing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's our no, fault. A, I think there's a lot of guys our age that kind of came up in the, 80s or whatever you know and even 90s you know it's kind of like kind of coming up for air we, you know for me like I'm, I'm getting i'm looking at empty nester here in the next year and uh you know it's like the wife's like well yeah if you get some things on the road you know you want to go hit the road a little bit, you know i'm kind of getting the thumbs up like you know hang around you know we don't we don't want you to you know disappear but um <laughs> you know it's time to get out there and get out and play again and do because that's a part of who we are, right? I mean, we, we started in music, you know, I started with guitar and playing in bands and that kind of thing. And so many bands, I mean, I was just looking at a post from um, uh, Ryan over at Pi. He had posted a thing of uh, the band X. Yeah. X from Los Angeles. I, I mean, them. I remember seeing Billy Zoom my first time and with that big wide stance with the silver, you know, the, the silver uh, big smile. jet. <laughs> yeah, the big like uh uh what's the actor he looks like? Um uh don't come to me, but anyway, just a killer band. I remember seeing them on the 1983 at Long Beach State, uh on the uh the grass field. And Billy Zoom's sitting there with his 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 feet like this, standing, you know, super wide stance, and he's got his silver jet on and he's doing his thing, and X scene and John Doe and DJ Bonebreaker playing their thing and they're throwing like they they you know it's punk rock right still was kind of a thing a little bit by 83 and you know there's a little bit of moshing but their crowd was a little had that kind of rootsy feel to it yeah. know, a little the rockabilly a little surf a little something in there and so it wasn't super violent but all of a sudden man people started picking up pieces of the uh of the turf of the grass like in chunks with all the you know, the, the dirt clod in it, you know, and they're hucking it. And, you know, it's like a scene out of the blues brothers, man. It's like, they they were wishing they had the chicken wire up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, but Billy Zoom sit there like this the whole time. It stuff's just flying by him and he ain't moving. He's just nope. smiling. 
<laughs> he just doing his thing, just going, dah, 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 you know. So anyway, I mean, we we saw that, and it's like, uh, I, I had moved to Florida for a couple of years, and I came back, and I see X is playing again with Billy Zoom back in the band. I'm like, I gotta go, right? And wow. even groups like that, they came out with a new album this year, Alphabet Land. A little plug there for the Orange County buddy. I grew up in Orange County, California. Yeah. So, well, X uh, has always been one of my favorite bands. I actually, oh, yeah. I bought their record after never hearing them. I used to get Slash magazine. I used to buy oh, yeah. a thing because, and I was always reading about all the LA bands like Black Flag and whatnot. And I remember them advertising the first X album, and I just sent away for it. I and it took like a month to turn up. And I remember putting it on at first. I was, you know, you're kind of expecting Ramones or Sex Pistols and going what is this? Yeah. And I, I was kind of taken aback. I was going, I'm not, I'm not sure if I like this or not. And then yeah. by the end of the week, I was going, this is something new and it's something better. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just, and so they've always been one of my favorite bands. They didn't come to Toronto much. They came like maybe three or four times in the original. And then they, they seemed to break up and go away for a while. And yeah. they hadn't played in Toronto for years. And me and my friend Ian drove to Detroit, especially to see them because yeah. We had to see them, you know, and yeah, yeah. we saw a lot that weekend. We saw how bad Detroit had fallen upon hard times, but yeah. seeing X was wonderful, you know, yeah. and they've been to Toronto since then. Yeah. It was just a show we weren't going to miss. Yeah. Yeah. We saw my wife and I went, got tickets at this place called the, Obs the observatory <laughs> in uh, Costa Mesa, Santa Ana, something like that here in California. We went and saw them and I'll tell you uh, the blasters open too, which was classic. Oh, wow. Um, it was such a great show. And to see them again, you know, Billy Zoom, he's actually come on a little bit of some health issues. He had some cancer. And so he was actually sitting down. He, he wasn't playing a silver jet. I was a little disappointed, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. He was playing a Gretsch still. He had a big hollow body, kind of like George Harrison looking one. Um, but anyway, it was it, it's great to see uh, creatives coming back out. You know, it's like we've all kind of raised our families, but we still got a lot of mileage left. Um, uh, but I do want to, wrap up too with what you're doing now you are doing so many things right now uh you sent me a link to um the uh the new cops sh show you're doing hudson and rex saw a little clip on that that's on uh city tv you're doing that so what else are you doing you're doing that and well yeah so hudson, what else are you doing yeah hudson and rex is like a family cop show um i was working on another like, detective show and they said well we have a new show coming up and it's a, it's a, a remake of a german show called that was commissar rex and it's about a police <laughs> officer who adopts a police dog and they solve crimes together i said you had me at dog you know <laughs> <laughs> right. so we're about to start our fourth season and these days when most tv seasons are like eight or ten episodes we're doing 16 episodes a season oh really okay and it's selling all over the world it's, it's really a show I'm proud of. Um, it, it's, they're good mysteries. Um, it, uh, it's a wonderful dog. The dog steals the show uh, and the actors are fantastic. And I, I've always chosen my work based on the people I work with. Like I know some people will chase more kind of artistically whatever shows and they'll work in a den of vipers because they think that's worth it. If I'm going to spend 12, 14 hours a day, I want to work with people I like and respect. So the company I work with is great. The actors are great. Every, so I'm having a great time doing that. But on top of that, you know, the Wasegas have been busy. In the last four years, we've released Gee. three albums. Nice. And um, so that I have a song coming up on, a, it's, I think it's released at the end of this month. It's a compilation called An Evening with Vincent Price. So everyone had to write a Vincent Price inspired song, which I did. And it was based on a Canadian horror after school show called Hilarious House of Frightenstein. And my song is called Summer Frightenstein. And I actually licensed an audio clip from the show of Vincent Price giving the, he used to read poetry <laughs> the show. So uh, I, I optioned a piece of his and that's great. Uh, then I have a four song EP also coming out on Missing Fink Records. Um, there's another comp couple compilations coming out, a compilation for Hallmark guitars. I think flashing guitar there. That's yeah. Hallmark guitars. So I Deke Dickinson's on that and Bob Spaulding and the ventures. So that'll be oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. Um, 
everyone in the surf community knows the sound of the surf music movie that's being made with the documentary, which is about uh, the history of Southern California and surf music. Yeah. I do. Well, Tom, Tom Duncan was looking to do a bit of a crowd funder on that. And I contacted him. I said, Tom, I could donate $25 and buy a DVD, or I can give you a bunch of my services. So I spent several months um, mm-hmm. editing extended interviews for his bonus disc. So I've done like two hours and nine minutes of like Dick Dale, Kathy Marshall, like extended ones. I did your dad, Bob Barrett. I did, um, I can never remember all their names. There's so many, I did so many, there was so many interviews. Yeah, Eddie Bertrand I did and Paul Johnson. So um, I, I just sent that to him last week and I thought that was much better than just sending a little bit of money. And I thought I would offer my services. In a few months I worked on it. And it was worth it. He's a really good guy. And I think that's a story that has to be told. Yeah. Um, I produced a music documentary a few years ago and it was the same thing. It was like 10 years of angst and carrying cameras, trying to get interviews of people that are tired of telling the same stories. And it was about Melody Maker Rock and Roll magazine out of England in the the 60s. So, and it started because the photographer lives in town in Toronto and he had some quarter of a million photographs, most of which had never been seen of like Zeppelin and Bowie and Jimi Hendrix and, and all this stuff, the stones, right. the Beatles. So that became kind of the spine of this great film. But it was so difficult getting that film done. When he went and did his GoFundMe thing, I, just, I felt his pain. So that's mm-hmm. why I, off, I offered the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, Sound of the Surf, right? That's called yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and I believe that it's it's going to ship uh, towards the end of the summer. I, I don't nice. want to put a date on, but, but but he's right at the end. He's at the very end. It's so hard to go across the finish line with a film, but he's right there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mark, it's so good talking with you. I really appreciate you just telling your story and how some of the the ups and downs of of the business but the you persevered you know you pushed through and and you've had success in multiple uh fields whether it be music or film and sound and that kind of thing so i appreciate you 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 taking the time i did want to say this one last thing you mentioned detroit i don't know how far a drive that is for you but uh safaris we're going to actually be playing uh in marysville um at a car show there we're playing with marshall crenshaw and um uh, Lee Rocker, you know, from the Stray Cats. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Player. We're, we're doing a show with them, the Safaris and that. So if you're looking for a road trip, love to meet you in person there. <laughs> you know what? That would be great. Right now, the border's closed. Um, oh, that's but, right. uh, the, Our Rockabilly band, the Millwires, we played with Lee Rocker once. And he was, oh, okay. he, he was phenomenal. I thought he sounded yeah. a bit as close to the Stray Cats as the Stray Cats. He was yeah, really yeah. phenomenal. And there was a lot... I'll tell you this funny story. A lot of people were waiting to get his autograph. And, and then someone in the band said to me, that ain't going to happen. He disappears faster than David Copperfield after the last song. You know? And sure enough, <laughs> boom, hit the last thing, turn the bells out into the limousine and boo! <laughs> He's gone. Yeah. And it was yeah. great. It was a great show. So if I can make that, I will be yeah. there. It's six yeah. hours. Yeah, we'll watch our thing. So uh, we're going to have all the links that you sent me in the show notes of this video. So if you want to know more about the Wasegas, you can go to the links there. Um, if, if you want to plug those uh, websites uh, here, it's wasegas.com. Yeah, that's easy. It's wasegas.com, and that'll give you our history and pictures. And you can buy T-shirts there, which I don't sell on the with Mark Malibu Wasegas Bandcamp page, which is where most people seem to go for the music. Um, you can also, if you're in the States and you want some cheaper shipping, uh, Double Crown Records has all our CDs. Uh, you can only get the vinyl from me currently. We have, because these these are CDs, but there's vinyl for uh, most of them, vinyl albums, uh, you know, some yellow vinyl, some uh, turquoise vinyl. Um, mm-hmm. So those are the two main websites to go to if you want to know more. Of course, the, the uh, Hudson and Rex, is that on Netflix or anything like that? Uh, yeah. You know what it is in the States? I do not. I wish I knew this, the um, the actual network that it's on in the States, but just Hudson and Rex, look for a good looking guy standing next to a German shepherd and you'll find the show. But it's sold around the world. It's it's really a great show. Yeah. And also, um, I, I was on Good Witch. 
for I did three of the movies and I did three seasons of the television series, which the season which just came out of Good Witch, they use a Wasegas song. Ah, nice. Yeah, there's, nice. there's a big bowling tournament and the mayor of the town has kind of a final showdown where she has to clean all the pins and they used a Wasegas song, which was kind of a spaghetti Western song. And and uh, okay. I just kept on telling them, kept on bothering them. They're like, use one of our songs, use one of our songs. Sure. And, and yeah, I yeah. said, well, do you have anything that would fit that? I said, well, of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> And it got approved by Hallmark, so thank you, Hallmark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, again, the crossover between the sound, the video, and you being in the video, being able to suggest that, uh, being kind of there at the, the point of sale. Um, well, you talk about monetizing music. Um, for me to land a song in a TV show is gonna it is about the same as selling, you know, a hundred albums. Yeah, so, yeah. so Good. that's monetizing and, it, and certainly when you have instrumental music it can find a home a lot easier than uh, a certain vocals sure sure well right on well thank you so much mark i really appreciate your time and uh you do uh you keep working on all that good surf music hopefully we'll connect up but uh again thank you everybody for tuning in to this uh, episode of creatives who thrive where we tell stories about people who are out there monetizing their art in a way that's uh productive and uh not only financially but also personally so thanks mark and uh you have a good one yeah you too thank you